morning and welcome to Waters Garden Center. Today's class is berries and grapes. Uh, so we're going to go through and we'll discuss all of that. I'm going to throw in a few dwarf trees as well as some gooseberries. Um, and we'll do a lot of question and answering if, if you guys need that kind of thing. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is blackberries. Um, blackberries and raspberries do really, really well here in Prescott. Um, Prescott, um, I always forget the it. Um, so uh, they get quite large, so definitely plan your locations appropriately for them. Uh, they can get anywhere from eight to 15 canes at a time. So you want to Plan your garden appropriately for the size of your uh, blackberries and raspberries. The uh, biggest thing with these is that uh, most of them uh, produce fruit on old wood. So when you, it comes to pruning, you really want to pay attention to the, the canes that produced this year you want to somehow mark them, whether you tie a piece of yarn or a piece of tape on it, because those are the ones you're going to cut down. The ones that didn't produce, those are the ones that you're going to leave on the plant for next year's berries. So that's really important. If you're not getting berries and you're pruning everything to the ground, be careful with that, because there's only a few varieties of raspberries that are every year they they bloom on new wood. So be really careful with that. Blackberries produce those nice, beautiful blackberries. Um, they usually have uh, gorgeous white flowers and, and they're actually very ornamental. So it's really nice to have them in, in, you know, along a trellis or something like that that can add to your, your garden element. Um, you have to be kind of careful with blackberries. They do have a few pests and diseases that are attracted to them. Um, this year, we are seeing quite a bit of thrip damage, which is kind of weird on the blackberries. So if you had buds that kind of started and no fruits coming out of it, um, we've kind of opened them up and we've actually found the thrip in there, which is really weird because usually thrip is gone by now. Once the heat really comes up, they're usually gone. But for some reason this year, they're, they're kind of hanging around. Uh, they also get some aphids, uh, diseases. Most of your varieties are pretty resistant, but they can still get like anthracnose, which is a disease on the, the, the canes themselves. They can get cane borers. Uh, which actually kind of burrow a hole inside of it, and then the, the canes will wither and die. So be careful with that type of thing. Um, they produce very well, and they, they multiply quickly. So um, again, plan appropriately. Raspberries are very similar to your blackberries uh, in regards to the way they grow, uh, the way they produce, the way they flower. Uh, usually you get your blossoms in the spring and usually midsummer is when you start seeing the berries come out. The um, heritage raspberry, which is this one, the fall gold is another one that bloom on new wood. So these are ones that you can actually cut down to the ground every year and still produce fruit. Some of the older ones like uh, Candy, the William Et, you want to cut back or make sure you're marking your, the ones that bloom, you got fruit on and the ones that did it. So you know which ones you're going to prune. Really important. And this is the fall gold. And this is one of my favorite raspberries just because of the color of the fruit. Uh, bright yellow fruit, very large, very sweet and juicy. Uh, again, this is one that uh, blooms on new wood. So just cut it back in the spring or in the early spring, you're gonna cut all your canes back for, for the new growth in the season.
Oh, I got a chance. Uh, this is a clipboard, the famous clipboard. Um, just put your name and your email address. Uh, this is where we're going to send you the, the information that comes with this class. Um, just because you were here last week, make sure you sign up because it's just for you guys. Um, those online, you want to make sure you can uh, put a text or however you comment in there if you want to receive that. Uh, that way we can get it out to you. So I'm going to give this to you and let you get it started. Okay, we're going to talk about grapes. Uh, grapes are probably one of the kind of more complicated fruits that we can grow. Um, and it's more just setting up their structure. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're just doing a trellised arbor, you can kind of let them grow. You do want to do some pruning because grapes like to be cut back. That way you get more fruit as, as they grow. Uh, if you have home gardens already and you have grapes and your grapes are really tiny, uh, grapes are over producers. They're going to try to produce as much as possible. But if you want big grapes, you need to cut them back. It's kind of like your fruit trees. You know, you don't want to have them so heavy that they're, they're breaking your trees. Um, you get all of that. Um, so grapes, what you are looking for uh, when you first do your grapes is a nice, strong cane at the bottom. Uh, that's going to give you your basic trunk structure. And then after that, you're, you're kind of looking for strong lateral branches that you can tie up. And these are going to be your basic canes for next year. And you're going to offshoot the ones that are going to come up. So um, it's going to get complicated. And I'm not going to go into all the complications because it, it does. It, it's like reading a computer manual. You know, it's like it's just hard. So basically, the, you want to look for strong lateral branches for your, your uh, structure and then keep your fruit from getting overpopulated. Uh, fertilizing all your fruits and vegetables, you're going to fertilize the three times a year, keep them on the schedule because we have such really bad soil. Grapes do really well in our hard rocky soils. So uh, if you have a hillside, they love that. Uh, if you have terraces, that's a great place for them. The only place you want to avoid when you're planting a grape is in a, if you have a shallow section of your yard, because that cold air will, will uh, cultivate in that lower area and you'll get more frostbite down in there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so her question was, is do they blossom? And, and the answer is yes. Those little green things, you, you, they're, they're almost insignificant as far as their blossoms go. Um, but there is a tiny flower that starts there and then the, the grapes form from that point on. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. The bees are always there. You have to have bees in order to pollinate. So uh, they always pollinate. Um, they don't need a pollinator. Um, but if you have a second uh, grape in the vicinity, you'll get better production. And, it, and that's basically for all your fruits and vegetables. They don't necessarily have to be the same type of grape, just another one. Blueberries. Blueberries are awesome. Um, they can do dual uh, functions because they are a fabulous ornamental shrub. 
with blueberries, you want to plant them in a shady spot so they can take some morning sun. They don't like our hot, intense, high altitude sunshine. So you need to make sure they get that protection. Uh, the other thing with blueberries is they are very acidic, so we have to amend the soil when we plant them. Or plant them in a pot. It, it helps you with that neutrality uh, to get them started. Eventually, you will have to add the sulfur to them to keep that pH lower uh, because our water has that pH in it. So every time you water, you're kind of add, adding to it. Um, and just the soil sulfur will do it. Or if you use the 744, it's not our fruit and vegetable, but the 744 does have the sulfur in it that'll help keep that lower. Um, blueberries also do really well with um, uh, just lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, they are a very ornamental plant. They have beautiful fall color and they do better with the pollinators. So you can, if you want blueberries more often, make sure you have one that's uh, yeah, like an early season, a mid season and a late season. That way you get blueberries all throughout the summer. Whereas if you have like the sunshine blue and the bushel berry, they're both kind of mid season. So all your blueberries are gonna happen all at once. Uh, with our freezers, we usually like to put them away and, and, and freeze them for later, which is also really easy to do. Um, most of them are going to get in that four to five foot size range, so they're great for putting them in containers and pots uh, for you that have smaller yards. Uh, it's a great plant to start with, but again, you have to make sure that they get a little bit of afternoon relief from the sun. Yes? Absolutely, you betcha. Colleen, uh, her question is, is do grapes like the full sun or shade? Grapes are definitely a full sun plant. The more sun, the better. Uh, so definitely get them out there. If you put them in the shade, you're not gonna get that ripening um, as well. Uh, you can also get more powdery mildew on that, the leaves themselves. Okay. This little guy here is a sunshine blue uh, blueberry. I love this one because the fruit is huge. Um, he's a smaller size in that three by three size range, which is perfect again for our, our smaller yards. Um, Self-fruitful, so like I said, you don't have to have another one, but if you want that huge production, go ahead and plant a second pot. Fig trees. Fig trees are one of those surprises around here um, because most people don't realize that they actually grow here. Um, they do uh, kind of die back in the winter time because of our colder winters. So watch that, be careful of that. Um, mulch them heavily, uh, keep their roots nice and warm uh, in the winter time, and that'll help them come back in the winter, in this early spring. Uh, most of our fig trees here, Typically, they can get in that 15 to 20 foot range if you're in California or other locations. But here, because of our hard frosts that we get, uh, they're going to stay in that probably 8 to 10 foot range, more of a small shrub. Usually, their, their fruit will, uh, you, you, you'll get fruit more late in late July, early August is when they start uh, ripening up uh, and they're there. Uh, one thing I was reading last night when I was kind of studying up on the subject, um, gophers love our, our big roots. 
I, I found that kind of surprising. I thought they ate everything, but I guess they're really prone to these guys. So if you're in that uh, gopher area, make sure you use a basket or use a gopher probe with the bait and try to get rid of them before you plant your big trees. Uh, most of your big trees are going to be self fruitful so you don't need a pollinator for these. And most are pretty prolific, so you don't need a second tree to get more production on them. one of the more unique uh, berries and this is a gooseberry uh, they are more native than anything else that's up here uh, you'll find these in in the wooded areas little brown fruits that start out green they have little white uh, stripes on them and then they turn pink when they ripen So this is a small one, uh, it's very, and this is what it kind of looks like. Can you see that? And they usually ripen towards the end of August, early September, and, and there you can pick them. Um, they're supposed to be fairly thornless, but when I picked this guy up, this guy's got some serious thorns. Uh, but it, 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 it's nature's way of protecting the plant. Beautiful fall color on this. Um, they kind of go orange and yellow, so that they're really, really pretty. Full sun. Everything here except for the blueberries are full sun. So the blueberries are, are my special child in this, this group of things. Okay, um, yes. Huckleberry? I I think that's a back east thing. I haven't seen them since I have been here. Uh, um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is dwarf fruit trees, and it's kind of not in the berries thing, but these are kind of unique in itself. Um, these are on special rootstocks, so they are only going to get about 10 feet tall, which is really kind of cool for our smaller uh, gardens around here. Uh, they're all uh, going to get, in, and when you prune them, you want them to kind of go out and up. You want, you're looking for that nice face shape, like uh, with your structure, that way you can get plenty of light inside of it. Um, the, the dwarf fruit trees, the varieties that we have now um, are the Fuji apple, there's Johnny Gold, um, there's a dwarf honey crisp. So you can get the apples that you, what you like to eat. Um, the nice thing about the Fuji is it's semi self fertile, so you do not necessarily need a pollinator for this guy. Uh, so uh, great tree for smaller yards, and it'll you'll get that production that you need. Uh, in the springtime, we do get dwarf uh, peach trees that are going to stay in that six by six size range, and, and they're very very productive. Um, the next thing I want to kind of talk about is is handling the the pests and diseases that these things will get. Um, each kind of have their own select, and then there's some crossovers that everybody tends to get. And this year, we've seen a lot of powdery mildew uh, because of our humidity level has been up. Uh, we've had like 30%. I think today we're like at 80. I feel like I'm back in Texas today because I'm sweating like a pig. <laughs> um, but um, it helps with our monsoon. So we, we can't have our monsoon without the heat and our and the humidity. So we have to suffer through it if we want the rain. So we need it. Um, for powdery mildew, um, a lot of people are using neem oil uh, on their vegetables, their, their trees and shrubs. And neem oil is 
a great natural spray. But the thing that neem oil does, it, it doesn't keep it, all, all it does is coat it. So all you're doing is look, uh, putting a layer of protection so it doesn't spread to the next leaf. Whereas if you're using a fungicide, that'll actually work to get rid of the fungal issue that you have. So you definitely want to um, use a fungicide on the powdery mildew and or if you're going to use your neem oil you're going to spray often because any new leaves that pop up you want to make sure that the your it's not spreading or keep an eye on that fungal because if, if it's there you, it will continue to spread unless you coat it with with the neem oil and this is uh, and this is the revitalize. You can also use the copper fungicide. We have a ready to use copper fungicide and that'll work as well. Um, all of our fungicides are um, ready to spray and you can use them up to three days. Look at the back because it depends on what you're spraying on whether or how soon you can actually eat it. Uh, but most of them are as organic as you can. Uh, controlling bug, uh, bugs and insects. Uh, we do have a new insect spray uh, that we brought in this year. Uh, this is Sayonara. Um, it is a derivative of our old one um, with the pyrethrin, but this actually will take care of spider mites, which is, we're really excited about. Uh, so it'll take care of 30, 130 different insects like your aphids, your skeletonizers, um, your uh, spittle bugs that grapes tend to get. Um, it's kind of a very unique type of bug and it actually looks like someone spit on your plant. So you'll, you'll see this foamy uh, blob on, on, in the crust of your leaves. And, and that is a spittle bug. And you want to make sure you're really saturated because they're, they're kind of protected by all those bubbles. Um, BT is a great uh, product for your skeletonizers, which are little caterpillars that are kind of blue and yellow, I think. Um, and you, you, you spray the whole thing. Uh, it is organic as well. Uh, it also works on your petunias, your geraniums for your uh, budworm, also on your tomatoes for horn, uh, the tomato hornworms, which somebody was in yesterday and they already have them. So watch your tomato plants because they're out there. I haven't had too many people in with grubs lately, um, but there is a product for your fruit and your vegetable gardens uh, for to, to handle your grub situation um, and still have edible fruit. So it, it, it's the eight and you just sprinkle it on. Uh, you can still harvest and everything else. It just takes care of those worms that are eating the roots. Soil sulfur is what you're going to use on your blueberries. Um, and actually, you can put this on everything in your yard. Our pH level is so very, very high that it, everything appreciates lowering it down. Uh, last week, Ken and I were talking to our newcomers class, and our pH level is usually in that eight ish uh, range. In most of your plants kind of like it in that six. Your blueberries are even lower than that. They like it in that four to five range. So if you ha are planting blueberries, you want to make sure you, you have a very acidic soil and, and the, the soil sulfur will do that for you. I kind of talked about the gopher shield a little bit earlier. Uh, the gopher shield is you actually it's kind of like a bucket that you put it in and it's a light mesh and it'll keep the gophers from coming up from the bottom 
and eating your hair roots until your plant gets big enough where it can kind of protect itself. Um, and it comes in a lot of different sizes, so for whatever size plant you're, you're going to put it in. Uh, but try to get rid of your gophers. If you let them go crazy, you're going to have a bigger problem down the road because they just continue to multiply. <laughs> this gal over here said she's got gophers eating her artichokes, her artichokes and all every time I hear a story about that I keep seeing cartoons where, where the vegetables just keep popping down the whole row is empty <laughs> okay. for most of your fruit uh, fruits, um, are one of our biggest pests that we have out there are the birds. Um, we all love our birds. We, we, feed, their, we feed them. Um, but when it comes to harvest time, we kind of don't like our birds because um, they'll, they'll poke holes in it and you'll have damaged fruit. So you can protect them um, with a, a netting. Um, that'll go over the entire tree. The most important thing is that you want to close it up at the bottom. I've seen people that just kind of toss it over and think, oh, it's going to be okay. And then the birds just go up inside and, and I don't know why the netting didn't work. Uh, but if you, if you allow them in, that, that's what's going to happen. Uh, these come in a variety of sizes. So if you have like a 25 foot tree, you can use it in cover the whole thing. Um, I don't know how people pick their 25 foot trees, but more power to you. <laughs> okay. Um, planting any of your fruits and vegetables, uh, basically it's anything just like planting anything else. We're going to dig the hole twice as wide and just as deep. That just as deep is really, really important here because we want things nice and even. Because of our monsoon season, we don't plant in a well uh, because things will drown with four or five inches of rain that we tend to get, like yesterday, we had like 20 minutes of hard downpour and, and the rain is just washing through here. So make sure that that doesn't happen because you'll, you'll end up with a lot of rot and you'll end up killing plants that way. So keep it nice and even, amend the soil, use plenty of premium mulch, so two-thirds natural soil, one-third premium mulch. And that helps get your clay soils um, open and so it doesn't continue to clump up. It also helps your sandy, gravelly soils hold that moisture better. So no matter what planting medium you have, you want to amend the soil. Uh, potting soil for your pots. You want to use a nice neutral potting soil like the water's potting soil. There's no fertilizer in it, so you start fresh. That way you can add whatever amendments that you need to add for that plant. Um, try to stay away from the miracle Grow because of our salt content in it. Um, planting your plant, water it in really well and then use the last couple of gallons and use the root and grow. That gets your root structure going um, so it, it can start taking off into the soil. Uh, it'll also help with transplant shock. Because of our heat that we have this time of year, it's really difficult to say um, how much water to give it because it, it with our rains, they're so hit and miss. If, if your soil is dry, water. If it is not, don't water. Usually we want to start with that twice a week watering and it works really well until we get a really monsoon and then you just let it go until you need to water again. Um, a lot of times this time of year we actually shut our systems off because that way we can control. Don't just continue to water or you're going to start seeing that over watering. Your leaves are going to turn yellow and you're gonna have issues down the road. Uh, that goes with your, your spruce trees and, and um, pine trees as well. So be really careful that you're not overwatering this time of year. Um, 
fertilizing the fruit and vegetable food. Yeah, and unfortunately, most animals do. Um, because it's made of uh, blood meal, um, they love that. Any animal is going to start digging in there um, because they like that blood, uh, the blood meal, the bone meal. Um, so if you do have a dog, I would suggest that you kind of work it into the soil instead of just like leaving it lay on top. If they eat a little bit of it, it's not going to hurt them. Um, but uh, make sure that you store this properly. If, if they eat more than a few bites, they will get sick. So be careful with it. Um, the great thing about the fruit and vegetable food is it does have that cal calcium in it, which helps with um, brighter, fresher fruit, bigger fruits um, with that calcium element to it. Um, the calcium element also helps our soils uh, in this area too, especially our clay. Uh, that helps with that too. Uh, humic acid is something that we're putting on a lot right nowadays, uh, right, or at this time of year. Um, this is just a soil conditioner that helps open the soil up. It brings in mycorrhizae and earthworms. Um, I know I told this story last week, but before I started using this, I had no worms at all on my property, and now I do. So I use this religiously since I've been here. Um, and it just helps overall health of your plants. You'll, you'll notice a difference. Okay. Um, pollinators. Um, we all want our fruits and vegetables to do well uh, and get started. So plant uh, strategically lavenders or catmint. I love the catmint because the bees love the catmint. Uh, the great thing about catmint is it starts blooming in April. Uh, it blooms to about now. I give it a haircut, basically I whack it back. Um, you don't have to be careful with it. Just take it almost to the ground. And my plants I took two weeks ago are already probably 12 inches tall. And they're ready to bloom already. So. Um, don't be scared of whacking this guy all the way to the ground. Um, like I said, the bees love this guy. You could do Russian sage if you have a bigger area. You can plant Russian sage around your garden. That helps bring the bees in as well to get that pollination going. The catmint. Um, there are different varieties of the catmint. This one is the smaller variety and it gets 10 or 12 to 18 inches. Uh, I'm sorry, I could have, I might have. So I apologize if I did say 12 feet, um, 12 inches. Uh, so um, catmint's a great pollination attractant. Rosemary, uh, it, it also is a great pollinator. Uh, blooms in the spring and the fall, uh, so it gets that start, the process started as well. Uh, the great thing about this is it is an herb green. Your lavender is too, um, depending on the variety that you have and how cold we actually get in the winter time. Um, but both of these are great pollination um, attractors. I think I got everything. Um, let's open it to questions because I, I kind of figured that we would have a lot of that. So let's go ahead and start. No questions? Really? <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, this gal over here has a grape that's curling. Um, so what I would say is to uh, take a look at the inside of it, because usually if a grape is curling, there's there's something going on underneath that. Um, it's the plant trying to protect itself. Usually there's aphids or spider mites possibly. Um, so if you want, you can bring a leaf in and we can take a look at, at it under the microscope. We'd be happy to do that.
yeah. Uh, so her question was, is she, she bought one of the Monfire peaches, which is one of our dwarf peaches, has really pretty purple leaves, and she's got a lot of fruit on it right now. And her question was, should she start thinning it out? Yeah, uh, thin it out a little bit. That way you get bigger peaches. Now, you don't want to pull the leaves off. Uh, the leaves are, are what gets that energy so your fruit production can, can continue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Goji berries. Those are the ones that are like the cross between a blueberry and something else, right? They're bigger. I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'm not familiar. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, not a goji berry. Um, but uh, I guess that's it. Anybody online have something? <laughs> okay. So all my questions. Yeah. I'll hang out if you guys have individual questions. I'd be happy to answer that for you. Okay. Well, thank you for watching. Um, if uh, Give us a like and subscribe to the videos. Uh, we really appreciate your support and help on that. So thank you.